Good afternoon. Has anyone had a good week? I've had a great week. I've been partying all week, actually. God's, God's sort of parties, though, you know. Uh, Tuesdays was great, wasn't it, with the discipleship group? We partied then. We partied on Thursday. We even partied last night. And on Wednesday, we partied too at the prayer meeting, didn't we? Do you know when it says two or more are gathered? Well, we've we got an army going on there on Wednesday, haven't we? I don't know what you're praying for there, Marie, on Wednesday, but it's uh, like nearly up to, th- was it 20, uh, nearly 30 people on a, on a prayer meeting. That's good. Um, I do need to sort out one issue, though, before we start. It's quite a serious one. I do have to mention it now. That, um, and it's for the whole church, really, to hear. Um, one Wednesday, it was mentioned that, uh, so I just need to clear this up, that um, when we started towards the end, and I started dancing, and, and, and this, this dance just needs to clear this little bit up. When I go like this, <laughs> can I just say I'm dancing in the spirit, imitating the eagle? Not what somebody said, which was a pregnant duck. I know who it was. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to clear that up, really. Um, so have you got your Bibles? Do you really want a banquet on what God's Word says for you today? Because he has got a banquet. That's good thinking. So can we turn to, let's have a look at uh, Esther, the book of Esther, Esther, chapter 9. And I'm going to read out verses 1 to 10. Okay. And it says this, the triumph of the Jews or the victories of the Jews. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But now, I love this bit, the tables were turned. And the Jews got the upper hand and over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. And his reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Parshandatha, Delphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridal, and Valzatha the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamidatha, and the en- who is the enemy of the Jews, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. I love the book of Esther. <clears throat> I just wanted to give a little bit of history there. I love that verse, though, where it says, and the tables were turned. And then we see God's people, the Jewish nation, going from victory to victory. So I want to go back a little bit. I haven't got the verses for it, but I think it's just worth bringing in a little bit of the history. If you go back a little bit in time, this was round about 500 years ago, before Jesus, I should say. And this table with the turns for this, something happened for the, these tables were turned. So what happened before we get to that stage? So I'm just going to go back a little while. Two characters. There was um, two of them mentioned there was Haman. Any other character? We haven't started yet. (laughs) And Mordecai. (laughs) And you've heard these stories before, and and this these verses are quite famous. And we hear that the the famous verses of such a time as this, and if I perish, I perish. But there's an important verse there that I have picked up on for this, which is the tables were turned. So what, what tables were turned to cause this victory, going from victory to victory, that the Jews or God's people experienced? And I want you to see that this applies to you. 
But as I say, let's go, let's go back a little bit. So we've got this Heyman geezer. So I want us to pick up, um, I like to visualize, it helps us to remember, doesn't it? So uh, let's have, so we pick on Graham for being Hay Heyman, just for a minute. Sorry, Graham. Can you, can you? Boo. <laughs> so what do we know about Haman from the book of Esther? Well, we know that he was proud. This is not, this is Haman, by the way, not Graham. We know that's not. He probably wore the same shirt and just as ugly, but he, we, we, we'll, keep, we'll keep to his characteristics for the moment, shall we? That's a few. But he was proud. It says in there he was proud. And he wanted everyone to bow down to him. He also wanted top dog. He wanted to be the top person. He wanted people to recognize him. He was the prime minister. Oh, get down there, boys. He was the prime... <laughs> <laughs> he was the top he wanted to be the top person and he, he, he wanted to get rid of anything and anybody that would stop him from being the top person did it ring any bells? he also hated who we're going to come on to in a minute a guy called Mordecai because he wouldn't bow down to him he was also, his name means magnificent. But not in the term of he's magnificent, but he wants to be magnificent. Have you still got any ideas who he's symbolic of in, in the book of Esther? But Mordecai is the other guy. So we'll have Howard now. If that's okay, Howard. <laughs> not only... <laughs> not only <laughs> Not only did Haman hate Mordecai because he wouldn't bow down to him, but he set about to kill and destroy him and everything about him. And Mordecai now is a Jew. Much better looking. But he's a Jew. And he refused to buy that bow down to Haman. But Haman hated and wanted to kill and destroy not only Haman, uh, not only Mordecai, but all the Jews because of this. But Mo Mordecai was humble. And he actually was the savior of the Jewish nation, along with Esther. Esther performed it, but he actually, Mordecai was the savior of the Jewish nation and God's people. And his name also means little man. But as in as in the meanings of he made himself little. Can you see where I'm going there? Just stay there for one second. Because if you read Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, they give amazing, amazing pictures of Satan and what happened to him. That's, that um, Satan was the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was in Eden the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God. But he was filled with violence and he sinned. So God drove him in disgrace from his presence. He expelled him. And this is because his heart became proud and corrupt on account of his beauty and because of his splendor or his magnificence. Wow. So I want you to remember that this was what Haman was like. But what was Jesus like? If you look in two, uh, Philippians verse 2, it says that Jesus humbled himself so much and being found, Philippians 2, 8, if, you, if you're writing notes, he says, and being found in appearance of a man, which was humbling in itself, he became obedient to death. He humbled himself to come, become obedient to death, even death on the cross. Thanks, guys. So, we see these two players in action. But what Haman wanted to do, he plotted. He plotted the, to kill and destroy Mordecai. And he plotted and ki to kill and destroy Mordecai's people. The people of God, the Jewish nation. So he set about and convinced the king, who, had held, who was held in captive, pe God's people, to convince him that he was against the king. And and asked him to set up a gallows, and he agreed to. A gallows to, to hang Mordecai on. 
with the aim of killing him off and then all the Jewish nation, all the Jewish people. But here's where the tables turned. The king found out that actually Mordecai was on his side, that he was his friend. In fact, he saved his life. And therefore, he didn't want to kill him. But instead, he found out that Haman was against him. And that he was, he found out his ways, found out his attitudes, and found out what his plots were. And so instead of Mordecai being hung on the gallows, Haman was hanged on the very gallows that he'd built for Mordecai. Can you see where I'm going? Satan plotted to kill and destroy Jesus and all God's people. But on the cross, on the gallows, and by the way, gallows there is the same terminology for being hung on a pole or hung on a cross. Same, same, same wordings, same root meanings. That's interesting, isn't it? That's quite coincidental, isn't it? And so yet, Satan, who plotted Jesus' downfall, on the cross, Jesus was victorious. He turned the tables. And if you want more proof that this is prophetic of that, of this victory on the cross, it was, it was 500 years ago. I believe it was 500 years ago, exactly, and 500 years ago to the day, because it was in the, the Passover month, the month of Nisan. So what we see is, is that 500 years exactly, 10 jubilee years, those who are interested in those things, that's, that's interesting too, to the day... Jesus turned the tables on Satan. The very thing that Satan plotted against Jesus, and therefore for us, ended up being victorious for, us, for Jesus and for us. The very thing that had for bad, God turned it round for good on that set day. And on that day, not only did Mordecai live and Satan die, sorry, not only did Mordecai live, and Haman live, and Haman die, but we saw Jesus live. And Satan was totally disarmed. The victory was Jesus's. But what does that mean for us? Well, Jesus went down from that cross to the very depths of hell, proclaimed victory on our behalf, and rose again. And when he rose again, he came into life. And all the Jewish nations then, and for us too, we too were given life. The Jewish people in the times of Esther were said, no, the plot to kill them is, is gone too. We'll let them live. So just as Jesus rose again, we too are allowed to live. We've been given life and life to the full. When Jesus went down into that dungeon, he declared, I have the victory. I have the victory against anything that the enemy has. He took hold of those keys, the, key, the gates of hell. He stormed in there, that foot, or was it that foot? He stormed in there and declared victory is mine, rose again and gave life. And all those who live for Jesus now share in that victory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are we, getting, are we getting going yet? Oh, hang on. And that, that's, that's for you. We too can, can live in the good of that victory. In, um, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, if it, it's, it's up there, should we just turn to that one? 1 Corinthians 15 says, death, death has been swallowed up in his victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And the sting of death is sin. But praise God, he has the victory. We have the victory too through our, through our Lord Jesus Christ. The very thing that was set for bad, Jesus turned it around for good so that we can live. We've been set free and have life. Can you see that? Just as the Jewish nation was saved then to give and receive life, we too, because of the cross, have been given life. 
and life to the full. And not only that, in Colossians 2.15, it says that because of the cross, I love this verse, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he then made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over the cross. I love that. So we too can share in that as well. So not only do we work in fullness of life, not only do we have eternal life, but we've been given that power and authority to rule and reign in life. We have those victories that we're going to see coming up right now. We already have the victory. Can you see this? So not only has he given us these things, but he's given everything under the whole spiritual realm to walk in that victory. So let's, let's just turn to these verses again now then. In, in, uh, in Esther. And see what, um, what happens next. So there we have that the, the tables were turned. And that table that's turned applied for us too. Because we heard this morning, didn't we? when Gilly was talking about new birth, that when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we were given new birth. We were given new life. Our slate was not only wiped clean, we heard. We've been given a new slate. Because we are, why is that then? Is that, that, just, that just words? That just to bump us up, make us feel good? No. That's what the Bible tells us. We've been given, we are a new creation. Everything that was before in your old life, and if you had a, and if you had an old life with stuff in it, <laughs> that's been wiped clean. That's a new slate is being given. A gift of life in Jesus, a gift of eternal life with all the power and authority. Because those power and authorities that were keeping you low, keeping you down, bringing you to death, were totally disarmed at the cross. And it made a public spectacle of by Jesus' victory on the cross. That's where we start from. That's where we start from today. Even before we hear another word, let, you, let yourselves know who you are. You are a new birth, a new creation, born to live for Jesus, have received eternal life. The kingdom, the, 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 oh, the, the death does not apply to you. It's, be, it's been wiped away from you. Your sin has been washed clean. Do we, do we believe that? Not up here. Do we have that in our hearts? If you have that in your hearts, praise God. Praise him. That's our God. That's what he's done for you. And now we can look at Esther verse 9 onwards. Because we see that there's still work to do. Because if that was the end of it, Mordecai and the Jews, that would be live ever after. When we come to the Lord and we've been baptized... You may as well, you may, the person who baptized you may as well have kept their foot on your head and you may as well have stayed under the water. But that didn't happen, did it? Why do we want us to raise up again? Because we've got work to do now. And he's going to show us what that work is. But we need to know who we are first. We need to know what Jesus has done for us. We need to know that the tables have been turned. <laughs> oh, I can feel it coming on again. Save that, save that. Okay, so on the 13th day, there's a set day for something. Do you know there's a set day for you to come to the Lord? That day might be right now. Do you know you're sitting here thinking, well, I've come here from a friend. I've come here just to find out what's going on. But actually, you're here for a purpose. And that purpose is your deliverance. Your purpose is to, re is to start life with our Lord Savior. And believe you me, we need him. We need him more and more. Also, you're here for deliverance of other stuff, which we'll come on to. So let's find out what they are. So on the, on the 13th day, a set day. And I want you to know that set day is the same terminology as, as um, the time had fully come. And do you remember in Galatians 4.4? 4? I think I've said this a few times. In Galatians 4.4, 4, it says, The time had fully come for God to send his only son. He also had a fully time, or and a God's appointed time, for Jesus to die on the cross, for him to be buried on the cross, for him to rise again from the cross. This is all very convenient, isn't it? This is all quite lucky. But this is the truth. This is the truth that we live in. 
we either believe it or we don't. In fact, when you, what we're going to, what we're going to hear is, we can do two things. We can either feed the spirit, and I do this every day, nearly every moment. We have the opportunities to feed the spirit. Guess what happens to your flesh, though? It starts to die. Or you can feed your flesh. And get what happens to your, guess what happens to your spirit? That dies. So even in the small choices, we have opportunities to feed the spirit and let the flesh take care of itself and die. But let's move on. So on this day, the enemy... Where are we on? Uh, we've got um, Esther up on the... On the TV, thank you. The tables were turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. In verse 2, no one could stand against them. Do you know no one can stand against us? Those who are in Jesus? What we're hearing here is truth applying to your life. Today is going to be a, you're going to move out of here today for your dinner, a different person, taking it from there to here. You either believe this, applies to you or you don't. Your choice, but this applies to you. Take this in your heart because this is God's gift, God's manner for you today. Please take it because you're going to move out of here changed. So no one can stand against, can anyone stand against God's people? Absolutely nobody because Satan has been disarmed. Yeah, but you don't know how I feel, Andrew. I feel quite low. Satan has been disarmed. Yeah, but those people over there, they don't really like me. And those Christians, especially some of them in there, just, they just don't love me. Satan's been disarmed. God is a God of love. And you know, it says, who can be, if God is with us, who can be against us anyway? We don't even have to convince ourselves because it's in this book called the Bible. That's very handy. So do we want to believe what our, our, things, our thinking is saying, our mind, our flesh, or do we believe what God's word says? I believe I'm going to believe this, because this is the truth. This is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. He is the word. He's the word become flesh. Then it goes on. And all the other nationalities, and all were afraid of them. <laughs> is, that, is that bravado? Is that something that we think, well, look at me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking good today, aren't I? I have to keep telling me that. <laughs> but all the national, everyone in the spiritual realm is afraid of us. All powers and authorities of darkness are actually afraid of us. But something has to happen first. The tables have to turn. Have they done that? It's already done. The work has been completed. Jesus didn't come back off and go back on the cross again. He stayed. He was there. It's finished. Say that again, Marie. It's what? It's finished. We can't have any doubt. It's done. The work has been finished. So when Satan comes up after you and says, well, you know, are you really a Christian? Look what you did this week. You should be ashamed of yourself. Do you really think you are? It's done. My slate's been clean. I've washed my feet. I've come to the Lord and asked for his forgiveness and I move on. And actually, there's another verse which we love. James 4, 7 says, when we submit to God and when we resist the enemy, what does he say? The enemies will gently leave. No, no, no. They flee. And you've heard this before. They flee for their very lives. That word they flee means they go because they're absolutely scared stiff of what's in us. And what's in us is pure and only the Holy Spirit. He, he doesn't, the Holy Spirit didn't just come upon us. He lives in us. We have God in us. No wonder he wants to flee for his life. He's fleeing for his life. Can you look at yourselves differently? Because that's who you are. You've been given that power and authority to do whatever you like to your enemies, it says. <laughs> and it also says in, in Ezekiel, if you read Ezekiel 28, it says that... Um, God not only threw him out, he took a third of the angels with him, but you're going to look back at this time and say, is this the person that leveled the earth? Is this the person that made the earth such a horrible place? What, this puny little thing? But those who stretch out their power and authority that Jesus has given you, you didn't deserve it. You've been given it by grace. 
You've been given it by grace for you to become all that you were created to become. You weren't, you weren't created to become like Graham. You weren't, kept, you weren't created to become like Paul. You were created individually, uniquely to become the person that you were created to become. You don't have to look and judge others. You don't have to. Because God's got a work going on in you. But the enemies will fear and tremble. Oh, these, these two verses just get better. And because fear of Mordecai had seized them, Mordecai was prominent in the palace and his reputation spread throughout the provinces and became more and more powerful. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. It's an understatement. Isn't that amazing? The more that Jesus is prominent in our lives, the more Jesus comes out of our lives. The more his reputation grows. Lord, I just want your reputation to grow. I just want you to live through me. I want others to see God in me. Okay. We'll make Jesus first place in your life. When Jesus is prominent in your palace, when Jesus is prominent in your life, the fragrance can't help but come out. The, we are the, fra the fragrance of Jesus comes out. Yeah, but, you know, um, I just don't feel like praising or worshiping God today. Make Jesus prominent in your life. I want, I want Jesus' fragrance to come out. I just, I want to I live for God. But I'll just have a little rest today. And the enemy's having a real go and I feel quite bad. Praise God. When you make Jesus first in your life, first prominent in your, in your palace, the fragrance overcomes. When you walk down the street, you're empowered. The aroma of God comes out of you. The fragrance of Jesus is unstoppable, making you unstoppable. We heard someone say today, didn't they? Let's be unstoppable. Who said, was that you, Linda? Someone said, let us be unstoppable. Well, we are unstoppable. We don't have to try. We just make Jesus first in our lives. We are an unstoppable force of God. Yeah, but I don't feel like it things are, you know, get on top of me. And um, it's, it's been a hard week. Yeah, it may have been a hard week. But we have the victory. Do you know, it's a normal Christian life to have tests and trials, but to receive the victory. Do you know that? And as we have, there's a, there's a beautiful, in the Old, in the old Testament, in, in old days, I should say, in times of Esther, the, the conquering king, have you heard me say this before? The conquering king would come back from the, from the war be victorious, and they would, they would have behind him his enemies captured, displaying them. Look what, we, look what I've done. Destroyed the enemies, conquering king. And they would throw out oil, fragrances, into the crowd, you know, just to make it look and smell good. But it was a display of the power and the authority and the victory that they had. That's a picture that we have, too. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 to 16, but thanks be to God who sometimes leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. Always. Someone's listening. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. So we're the, we're the aroma of God. When we put Christ first in the palace, our, our, our beings, the fragrance pours out of us. Have you ever been with people who just, they just smell Jesus, don't they? They just exhume God's love. They're just, they're just fruit. They're like, the Bible calls them like an apple, crisp and light and refreshing. Have you ever met people who are like that? That's because the aroma of Christ is flowing through them. They're, they're taking captive the enemy and displaying it for all to see. That's us. So we too can parade the enemy. We too have that victory. Always we can have that victory. Let's move on. I think we should finish there here. Enough, really. That's pretty good, isn't it, so far? Should we carry on though a little bit more? What are we looking at? Oh, Esther, that's it. So, 
And he became more and more prominent. In verse 5, Esther chapter 9, verse 5. And the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. And in the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. And then they also killed these 10 geezers, these 10 sons, in fact, the sons of Haman. Well, hang on a minute. Haman's just been killed on the cross, the gallows. So what's these 10, why do we have to deal with these 10 sons of Haman? So who are these 10, why are they still around? Why do we have to kill them at all? Why have they even been mentioned in the book of Esther? Because something lives on for us to overcome. And it's actually called our flesh. That's why we didn't, the baptism foot didn't stay on our heads. Because we got work to do. And that's to feed and glorify Jesus. And as we do, we will overcome the flesh. and Because they will live on. We will never, we will never actually get rid of all our flesh. Because we'll, we'll never be perfect until Jesus returns. So, and actually if you look up the word flesh, it actually means one word. It means self. Do you know, we are in opposite. We were in opposition to God, self. And it's interesting that if you look at all the names of then ten sons, ten actually also means um, full, the fullness of or complete. And all those ten names mean self something. All of them. That's handy, isn't it? That's quite coincidental again. This book's quite coincidental, isn't it? But all ten names are all meaning self-something. So the picture in Esther is that they, they need to be killed off. And actually, I'll throw this in now for free. Later on in the verses, it says that they need to be hung. So what we see is that they've actually been killed, but then why would they need to be hung? Because that hanging isn't the form of, of death. They've already been killed. It's a public display of them. They're there to be public displayed. So as we are delivered from our flesh on a daily basis, we too can display this in our testimony. That's what testimony is. It's testimony to what God has done in your life because you've overcome the flesh. This book of Esther is unbelievable, isn't it? It must be too good. It must have been written after Jesus. No, it was written 500 years before. So, if you look at those 10 names, and I have to write down the meanings because I, I, would, I would forget them, then actually them 10 names, oh, lost my notes there now. Anyone seen them? Just hang on one sec while I, I look at my notes there. No, that's not it now. Hmm? I kicked them somewhere. Just hang on one second. Oh, here they are. Okay, so then ten, those ten sons of Haman all mean self-something. This is where you guys come in now. Because I want to read these ten meanings off. And I, and I believe, well, I, 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 I believe that these ten, which is the fullness, every one of us who has flesh in them, which we all have, have some of these in us. This is like the complete list. Parshandatha means curious self. So I want this to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just blow across your garden right now and just touch people where they need to receive deliverance from these things. Curious self. So Parshandatha means, which has to be killed off, nosy or gossip. It involves you being involved in things where you don't need to be. You whisper in people's ears. You gossip. You, you actually, physical signs are you judge people. Dalphon means weeping self. 
which means self-pity. It's like, woe is me. Nobody loves me. Nobody rings me when I'm feeling down. All these problems that I have and nobody helps me. It's a self-pity. And you're, you, you actually become very negative. The third one, aspatha, means enticing self. You're easily enticed by things. You may have lots of magazines of material stuff. Not, not these are all wrong, but if it's, if it's what the Holy Spirit brings to you. Or you may have videos. You may be lazy. You may have excuses or not being included in activities in the church or with, with God. You may also feel quite depressed because you go on highs and lows. But enticing self. Poratha means generous self. That means self-indulgent, ignorant of the needs of others. In fact, ignorance of the needs of others, full stop. You're generous to self, but miserly towards everyone and everything. You give as little as you can get away with. Whether that be in your tithing, your tipping, your contributing to things, and you, you're consistently thinking about money. Adalia means pride or weak self. It means self-exalted, proud, not humble, no humility. You boast. You promote yourself and what you do. Aridatha means stubborn self. That means, well, stubborn self. You're strong and assertive, but you won't move. You're self-willed. It's your way, even if you know it's the wrong way. You do it on your own. This, this leads to external things of lack of trust. You don't trust in God's word and you don't trust in what God says, only in your ways. Parmashta means ambitious self. It's a character of feeling superior or an arrogance. Your way is the only way. You want to be the leader. You want to be seen. You want your good deeds to be seen. Arasai means bold self. You're very bold, but in the, in the way of being pushy, ignorant of other people's feelings. They're, they're sort of like loud and in your face, and they make you feel uncomfortable. Aradai means dignified self. You're proud. You're superior. You think you're superior, regardless of others. And you have a lack of love, a lack of care, thoughtlessness. And finally, Vyazatha, pure self, self-righteous. You believe that we can be righteous through our own self and our own works and through our own efforts. These will lead to things like being frustrated or burnt out, no peace or restlessness, a fearfulness even, an insecurity, and again you have ups and downs. These are the things that Jesus has set a day for you to overcome because they're in you. One of those means you'll hear the word of God because you're stubborn. You think he doesn't apply to you. Let me tell you now, they apply to me and to you. And he set a day for you to overcome those. And one of those days is right now because he set a day for you to hear this word. Despite people not want, thinking that this is the word for today, it is. He wants you to bring that. He wanted me to bring you this. And this is so that you can see who you are in Christ. See what he has set for you. And see that and know that you are an overcomer. He's given you everything you need to overcome. He will not put you in any position where you can't overcome it. Take that as truth first. But also take truth that when he convicts you, it's not because he just wants you to feel painful for a few minutes. It's to help you to cut those cords. He will place in you people and circumstances to help these things in you so that you can see for yourself where your flesh is. Because the flesh is painful. When you, when you, you know, if I went and pinched Linda really hard, so I go and do it. Now, if I really pinched Linda really, it'll be painful. And the flesh, your flesh is the same. 
no. Your flesh screams out, please feed me. But your Holy Spirit says, glorify Jesus. Know that you are an overcomer. Know that overcoming is the only way to become all that God created you to become. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray. And you don't have to, you just stay where you are. But I want you to just focus on Jesus. And as I read these names out again, turn from them. Repent of those. Know that your deliverance is near. He set a day for them. And know also that he will forgive you. And when he forgives you, and you come through the other side of that mountain, you're in a higher place. A place more intimate with the Lord. Hey, right. Thanks, Gray. It's the Holy Spirit's role to bring conviction. John 16 tells us that um, that's, his, that's his aim. It, also, it says in John 16 that the Holy Spirit's role is to convict you of sin. And sin is, it says there, is not believing in the Son whom I sent. So if you haven't given your life to the Lord Jesus and you want to, then do that today. Come up to the front at the end and come and see one of us who you know to be a Christian to pray for you. But... I'm going to read out these verses and I want the Holy Spirit to convict you. Only. So if the Holy Spirit's bringing to you Parshandatha, nosy gossip, repent and turn away. Know the Holy Spirit has forgiven you and will move you on. If it's the son of Haman called Dalphon, weeping self, self-pity. If it's Aspartha, enticing self, easily enticed with material things. If it's Poratha, generous self, self-indulgent and selfish. If it's Adalia, pride and weak self, Self-exalted. If it's Aradatha, stubborn self, self-willed. If it's Parmashta, ambitious self, arrogance and superiority. If it's Arasai, bold self, pushy, ignorance of the feelings of others and lack of love. If it's Aradai, dignified self, Proud, feelings of superiority and regardlessness of towards others, and lack of love, care, and thoughtfulness. Or finally, is it Vyazatha, pure self, self righteous, d- doing things in your own effort and by your own works? Father God, as you convict your people. Let them know that they're forgiven. Let them know that this day of deliverance is because you love them. Because you want them to move on. Because you want them to go from glory to glory. Let them know as they move on from this today, they're in that procession. And the fragrance is let loose in them even more. That fragrance of you, that aroma of God, And that they can display through their testimony what you have done. Only by your spirit. Only in your power. For your glory. And in your name I pray. Jesus. Amen.